<laughs> so I have a distinct pleasure of introducing Rabbi Mark I want to give you a very quick personal background for me. How many of you have either been to a service or heard of a service where a left-wing rabbi shared his views from the pulpit? How do you feel about that? Okay. Yeah, it's not good. Okay? So... We, many of us have stories like that, and um, personally, I, know, I think that you should only know that the rabbi loves Israel, loves America, and kind of wonder where he gets political. I think that's probably the best way. Because whenever there's preaching from the pulpit, is it ever from conservatives? It's always from the left, isn't it? So this is the second year in a row that we've gone to, uh, to Rabbi's uh, Temple, near Sinkra, for I always. And you know, you could come on Shabbat too. Yeah, we could come on Shabbat too. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of pretty Asian with Shabbat. We've been a lot of different temples. But nonetheless, my happy. It's very nice. Your Monday night classes. Okay. <laughs> As I shrink. Uh, so I will tell you that uh, I didn't know where he stood with me. I had no idea, which is really the type of you that I be. On Yom Kippur this year, he gave the most unbelievable speech, which you're going to come up today, about anti-Semitism. He had the courage to say, I don't care where you are politically, you can't support those anti-Semites in Congress. And he named them. I was so blown away. Yeah. yeah. And we, the Judaism definitely needs more rabbis and all that uh, So you're in for a treat. We're so, and also, we have got courage. I know a lot of rabbis would say, I can't speak in front of you, you're going to just go on and say, okay, I understand. So this also takes courage. Let me give you a brief uh, intro. Rabbi Michael Michael Barkley is an author, college professor, and a recipient of the 2010 Distinguished Humanitarian Award for the Benign Zion Foundation. He is the author of Sacred Relationships, Biblical Wisdom for Deepening Our Lives Together, a book with the rare blessing of having been endorsed by academics and spiritual leaders around the world, including the Vatican, the Vatican, Oprah's guru, and the chancellor of Oxford. Rabbi Barkley writes for multiple periodicals, including the Jewish Journal and PJ Media, and is a frequent contributor and tour commentator for the Jewish Journal of Delhi. Rabbi Barkley both taught in the School of Theological Studies at Loyola Marymount University, and was also the Hippo director, where his one program became a national model for small college campuses. Rabbi Barkley is a spiritual leader of Carol Mayor Simcock in the Wesley Village. Most importantly, he is married and father of twin boys who constantly remind him to live fully, ethically, and with joy, to always act right and righteously. Please give a nice warm welcome to Reverend Arthur. Thank you. Thank you.
was hundreds of years after the destruction of the temple, before we understood what Judaism was to become. Similarly, we're still dealing with that, that thought and focus. But the reality is the reality. We are in a place where over 70% of Jews in this country will vote Democratic. I love this man's body language. It's like, I dare you to a president right now. <laughs> so we are at that place where, where three quarters of the Jewish population will all vote on the left. And it doesn't matter what the left says. They have converted to another religion. <clears throat> And like any religious converts who become fanatical about it, this is where they see it. And they don't want to hear anything from the other side. <clears throat> but does that mean that they can't be converted back? And I would say to you, no. In fact, I would say the exact opposite. We all have an obligation as Jews or as non-Jews, if you're not Jewish here in the room, you have an obligation as well. If you'd like to become Jewish, I have a cigar cutter in the car. Um, <laughs> To make sure that we bring them back to Judaism. Now, once someone becomes more observant, he's running away. Um, once, someone, once someone becomes more observant, once someone comes back to Judaism, it's interesting that their politics, the more observant someone is, the more to the right the politics are. And there's a lot of reasons as to individual responsibility, faith, etc., and passion. So, we want to get people who are currently secular leftists. Jews, back to the <clears throat> Jews, and then their politics will follow. Fair? That does not mean, by the way, that we need them to become Republicans. Because the reality is, I don't want everyone to be Republican, no offense. I would rather people take back the Democratic Party and we had a real party, and the discussion was an honest discussion instead of the craziness that's going on. Can everyone agree with me on that? Okay. I, I don't even want to be a Republican. Besides who wants all the Jews in one party and can't be okay. So the question becomes how do we do that? So I've given you this handout. So we're going to go over a few things because what I talked to Bruce and Mitch that in the last number of months I, I think it's very important about what keep politics off the pulpit. I think it's very important that we bring Jews back to the theological issue. And Thank God, Stan can vouch for this, I've had some success in doing it. In bringing people who were on the left, and they thought that they weren't, bringing them back away from the current Democratic Party. So let's take a real quick look at, at some of this. Uh, the goal of all this is to get these lost Jews back to Jewish values. Fair? Okay. Again, we're just going to go over this very, very quickly. We're not going to adopt the Talmud, but we will go over some of these things. There's a process. It is a multiple step process. The first thing is, how many of you like President Trump? How many of you like what President Trump has done for Israel and for Jews? Okay. How many of you are supporters and advocates for President Trump? Stop. <laughs> the moment you bring up Donald Trump in a dialogue with left a secular Jew, you have lost. Okay? You have lost. Mitch referred to high holidays. I did a lot of wrestling this year. I felt it was extremely important to call out Tel Aviv and Omar at high holidays. If you don't do it there, where are you going to do it? Okay? On the other hand, I will not talk politics from the pulpit. So how do I go about doing that? A number of people came up both on the left and right after the sermon, and they were very, very happy with it. Okay? And I don't write things down. I'm going to write the writings, but I don't write sermons or anything down. So it's always kind of a throw the dice anyhow. But it really did work because it was about theology. So first of all, take Trump off the table. If you're talking to a leftist Jew, take Trump off the table. Don't talk about how good he's been for Israel. Don't talk about the name of the train station after him. Don't talk about his Orthodox kids or grandkids. Take it off the table. So they can't bring it on the table. That's the first piece of the process. Okay? Let's be clear. We have a goal here. Our goal is to take that leftist secular Jew, bring it back to the fold. Is that fair? So we got to do it in a smart way. Take him off the table. Don't bring him up. When they bring him up, say, I'm not talking about Donald Trump. We're not talking about Donald Trump. We're talking about being Jewish. Take it out of the realm of politics and into the realm of religion. Because at the end of the day, every one of those leftist Jews has a Jewish shaman. 
They have a Jewish soul that desperately wants to be connected with his tribe and doesn't know him. So the first thing is to take Trump off the table. If you keep him on, you lose. The second thing is, okay, you need to help them get to a point where they recognize the following question and they come to the right answer. Each of you who are Jewish, please don't answer me, but think in your head, do you view yourself as a Jew living in America or an American who happens to be Jewish? Now, whatever you view yourself as, you need to understand and recognize that the majority of the rest of America and the world views you as a Jew living in America, as an outsider. If we can get that secular Jew, that leftist Jew, who say, I'm American first, well, that's fabulous. The German Jews thought they were German first, too. The Spanish Jews in 1492 thought they were Spanish first. It doesn't work out so well, does it? And we're going to talk a little bit about that, why we're the outsider. <clears throat> why they view us as an outsider. But the part of the goal is to get them to realize that they are viewed as a Jew living in America. Help them change their identity. You are setting off time bombs inside of their consciousness. They may not explode right then and there. They don't need to. Let it go over time. All right, so take Trump off the table. And remember that one of the goals is to get them to understand that the rest of the nation Use them as the outsider. Okay? Everyone with me so far? These step three. Do not attack the Democratic Party. You lose. Okay? Don't take on the fight. You lose. There is nothing wrong with the Democratic Party. It's the people in it that are messing <laughs> So don't take on the Democratic Party. For most of us here, most of us as Jews in America, our parents and our grandparents were probably Jewish. Or were probably Democrats, weren't they? This is not a meeting, which is good because I drink. But I have a confession to make. I worked on Jerry Brown's presidential campaign in 1990. Okay? Great statement, right? If you're, if you're young and not a liberal, you have no heart. If you're old or not conservative, you have no brain. So, <laughs> we, but I grew up, like most of us, our parents were Jewish and Democrat. And they, they were hand in hand, fist in glove. Don't attack the party. When you do, you're attacking their parents, you're attacking their grandparents. You will lose. Our goal is not to play, our goal is to, to get every Jew back to being Jewish. Does not mean that it's going to be here, she's going to be coming, but to get them back to being Jewish. Okay? So please don't attack. You must educate them about anti Semitism, and we're going to go over a little bit of that in a moment. If they can realize that this anti Semitism that is, they're feeling right now is not a product of Trump, but rather a byproduct of 2,000 years, then it changes. And this is a really, really important piece to understand. For 2,000 years, there was overt anti-Semitism. In 1945, after the Holocaust was revealed, it wasn't hip to call yourself an anti-Semitic. You couldn't say those damn Jews anymore. And so we're rested after World War II. There was no anti-Semitism, overtly. But you're not going to cure 2,000 years of anti-Semitism in a generation or two, are you? And so this anti-Semitism was just subversive, subjugated. And it reappears in the 1970s and 80s as anti-Israel. It's okay to be anti-Israel. You know, those Jews, they were killed in the Holocaust, so I don't want to say bad things about Jews, but Israel, we can say bad things. And so anti-Semitism becomes anti-Israel. Israel is an apartheid nation and all that kind of stuff. Okay? BDS movement, all of that. Let's be clear, anti-Israel is anti-Semitism in a different manifestation. Moment the United says Zionism is racism, they're just expressing what they've been feeling a long time, which is how can we hate the Jews? You must get the liberal secular Jew to understand that anti-Semitism is too deeply ingrained, and that they grew up, if they grew up between 1945 and the mid 1980s, they grew up in a unique period of history where there was not overt anti-Semitism. So I don't know about you, but I didn't experience overt anti-Semitism. I experienced a little in college. I grew up in Sherman Oaks. That's in the, the, the shadow where I went to school, right? <laughs> <coughs> and 
And so, you know, if you think about that, that's what's so important. People think, American Jews think, oh, there's no anti-Semitism because they grew up in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. They aren't realizing that what we're starting to experience now is what our ancestors have experienced for 2,000 years. We need to educate them. This may be the single biggest trick you have in your bag to take and convert them back to Judaism. Because there have been numerous people, Stan has seen, seen it with a number of cases, once they're educated about the history of anti-Semitism, they realize that this is ingrained, so deeply ingrained. They all of a sudden say, wow, maybe I really do need to realize I'm a Jew first. So we're going to go over a little bit of that education depending on, on how much time. Okay? When your liberal secular Jew decides to attack the Republicans or the Trump or whatever, don't defend them. I'm not talking politics, I'm talking religion. I'm not talking politics, I'm talking theology. I'm not talking about the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. I'm talking about being a Jew. Change the dialogue, change the argument. Keep it focused so that it's religious and theological, not political at all. The moment you allow it to be political, you lose. You will lose. The key is to keep it about Judaism about their children and their grandchildren. You know, it's much easier to say to someone, you know, uh, would you have your son or your grandson? Did you go to his breast? Yeah, he's lovely having a good breast. Do you know this Democratic presidential candidate who wants to make the circumcision illegal? I'm not against the Democratic presidential candidate, am I? I'm against making my religion illegal. Do you see the flip on it? Don't talk politics. It's not important. Talk theology. And again, I want to go over some, a couple of things briefly. In this handout, there's a lot of details, a lot of things, a lot of ammunition you can use to help someone change from thinking that, oh, life is hunky dory and John Lennon is right, let's just all imagine a world without boundaries. And that would be great for Jews. Uh, as opposed to what the reality is. And, and uh, by the way, if you want a, a wonderful book if you, if, that I was recently introduced to, um, John Lennon and the Jews, A Theological Rampage. It's a fabulous book about how basically the song Imagine is the definition of hell, and uh, we need to be Jews. Fabulous, fabulous. All right, I want to give a little bit of history so everyone understands anti-Semitism on a different level. Now, some of you I know are from other countries, like in Russia, where your ethnicity was Jewish. That's what you were at. Some of you grew up in the shtetl of the San Fernando Valley, on the west side of Los Angeles. But we need to look at just a couple of things, and I know where's Stephanie? There you go. I know you're going to give me a five minute notice. I am. <laughs> you're, you're 15. Like a half an hour? You have 15 minutes. Why 15 minutes? <laughs> Not five. Right. Why don't I go until it's five minutes? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. It's good my dad, my dad got us this, so it's not sure we go very, very, very already. <laughs> Uh, Anti-Semitism is unique in terms of it is a, is a hatred that is not based on any gain. Typically, hatred is based upon gain of land, power, money, etc. That is not what anti-Semitism is based on. And really, in Western culture, you need to understand the, the roots of it. The, the followers of Jesus who were called Jew, Jewish Christians or the early Christians, 2,000 years ago, are persecuted by the Jewish establishment. No question. Okay? That being said, the Gospels are a fairy tale, historically. I'm sorry, but they are. In terms of the relationship, I'm sorry for anyone who believes in the Gospels, but historically, in terms of the relationship, specifically with the Jewish establishment, they're a fairy tale. Because here's the reality. The Gospels are written as a polemic against the Jewish establishment at the time because the Jewish establishment was attacking the early Christians. Everyone with me? Okay. And they put things in the Gospels to attack the Jewish establishment at the time they could not have happened. The first and most basic thing is there's this trial of Jesus that happens right after the last hour. How many of you have heard about this trial? Okay? Anyone heard about this trial? Right? There's this trial that happens. Um, the problem, and, and the Jews supposedly choose this thief as opposed to Jesus. Sound, sound familiar? Okay. Here's the problem that's going to happen. Because there's no court allowed for case off. So saying that it happened is the exact same as if I said, hey, Stan, I beat a traffic ticket on Christmas Sunday. 
we all want to be in Seder Shana, there is no court on Christmas, let alone Sundays. Same thing. Couldn't happen. By the way, he would not have come in on Passover. There were three festivals that you needed to pilgrimage, take pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Passover, Sukkot, and Shavuot. Only one of them to get palm fronts, it would have been Sukkot. But it's a nice story that happens with spring and the refurbishment of life, the renewal of life. But when he was coming in, if they're throwing palm fronts, we don't cut palm fronts for Passover. Right? We cut from Christmas. So, first of all, blame for killing Jesus, not possible. Doesn't matter, it's in the gospel. Second of all, we have this document that's called the Vulgate. I'm going to give you a couple of things here. The Vulgate is a fourth century document. It is the official translation of the Bible. Okay? It's done, I wrote down who it's done, it's by I think St. Augustine or St. Sunday or Christmas. And so the, the Vulgate is a translation of what we call the Hebrew Scriptures. It's not. Here's your problem it is clearly anti Semitic. And you give an example. How many of you speak Hebrew? How many of you read Hebrew? How many of you know Hebrew's language that goes from right to left? <laughs> um, okay, so here's the reality. There is a word in Hebrew, Quran. Quran means that uh, light shone from you. There's a word in Hebrew called Karen, which means form. Yeah. Okay. It says in the Torah that Moses cut on. Moses had these lights that shine through this old power that, that the rays of light shone from Moses' forehead. And we know that the translator of the Vulgate knew that it was supposed to do the right translation because he translates it correctly elsewhere. But he writes down there that it says Moses came down from Mount Sinai with horns. Hmm. How many of you heard Jews have horns? And the Britney laws when we have it removed. And so we are now accused of killing God. We're responsible for the killing of God, the aside. We have horns. Now we're starting to be associated with Satan, aren't we? This is all by the fourth century. Or 1500 years ago. And so, and, and, and this concept of horns becomes perpetuated, you will find a picture of it on, on page eight. eight. Michelangelo makes his famous statue of Moses and has horns. So, we kill God, we have horns. We must be associated with whom? The devil. Right? This is, we're talking about grain for thousands of years. Then at 1144 in Norwich, England, a little boy goes missing during the Passover Easter time. And so the local Catholic priest says, well, that's because the Jewish people need to take Christian Catholics, only Catholic boys at this time, need to take Catholic boys, hang them upside down, drain them an upside down cross, drain them of their blood, which they use for months. It becomes called the Blood Libel, 1144 in which England is perpetuated up until and through today. We drink blood. God, we have horns. By the way, that Vulgate translation from the fourth century, how when do you think that stopped being the official Catholic Bible? Mm. Late 1970s. Mm. So for 2,000 years, basically, it has been ingrained in consciousness as you read Jews have horns. As you read the gospel, mm. Jews kill Jesus. Not we got we all got it's not possible, right? I'm not saying, by the way, that the, the Pharisees that Caiaphas and these other guys were not covertly involved in his death because there was a lot of corruption going on, but it was not a Jewish piece. Does everyone get that? Really important. And so, we have all these things for 2,000 years. We drink blood, we drink horns, we kill God. And you know we're different too. We don't eat the same food as our Christians. We don't wear the same clothes. And myths begin around us. How many people have heard that an Orthodox couple make love with the between the sheets? How many people have heard that? Okay. Okay. Um, you know where that myth probably started? We have something called a Tlaxcacan, where we wear our, our talus underneath our shirt, there's a little tzitzit, right? Well, when, before we had 
washers and dryers, you would wash the clothes, you'd hang them on the clothesline, right? It looks like a small sheet with a big hole in it. And so the Christian neighbor said, ah, see? There's Rick's sheet with a hole in it, because that's what he makes love to his wife on through. <laughs> Which always seems very flattering because they think you need a whole life. So it becomes embedded in consciousness for 2,000 years. And if you look at a lot more of the details, that Jews are affiliated with, with the devil and all these different things. Is this anti-Semitism going to stop in 50 years? No. This little respite that we had at the end of the 20th century is a unique break. We need to let our secular Jewish friends know that they grew up in a unique time. If we start doing that, if they start realizing that, then they start realizing why the rest of the world will view them as an outsider. Because every Catholic that you know who was born before the late 70s grew up, and many of them still, you know, how many of us still have the Bible as our grandfathers and have not run the bookstore to buy another one, right? So they've grown up until the late 70s. Their Bible in their house says all these things about us. That doesn't get cured in 50 years. Once you can convey that to your secular leftist Jewish friend, then all of a sudden it becomes a different story. Now the issue is, whatever you think you are, the rest of you, the rest of the world, the rest of the country, views you as an outsider. This isn't changing. Now we start getting into anti-Israel by the time we're in the 70s and 80s. Because you can say anti-Israel. We don't want to talk about how, how ugly and dirty all those Jews are. Just after all, we did kill six million. But let's talk about how horrible their country Israel is. <coughs> Who's been to Israel? Ever seen a park like that? <laughs> the BDS movement is, for all intents and purposes, an attempt to destroy us philosophically, theologically, and existentially, as well as physically. There's a, there have been licensing all sorts of things in Europe. How many of you heard about the star that had to be on products that were coming from Israel in the European Union? Is that any different than the star they wanted us to wear on our chest or in the Holocaust? Same thing, isn't it? So when you see someone, and this is what you need to convey to the secular friend, to the leftist friend, look, forget about politics. When someone is being pro BDS, when someone is going and talking about anti Israel, stand up. Get them to get to the place of realizing that anytime someone attacks Israel, they are attacking their survival and their children's and grandchildren's survival. Now you move them from, we hate Trump and this is our party, to, you know, I'm a Jew and I gotta watch out for my kids. I'm waving back. So, <laughs> I'm gonna look quick. So, come on, I just covered 1900 years of 10 minutes. <laughs> Walking on water. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna make these five minutes into 15 or 15 or five. So I'll tell you what time. So here, if you look on some of the handouts, you will see a number of things that have gone on. That demonstrations in modern times. You'll find them on uh, pages 11 or something. You will find a number of different things that have happened nationally and internationally. Use them as saying to your non, to your, not to your secular leftist friend. Look, we haven't started any war. Every single conflict in the Middle East, Israel has been the defender. That is the reality, the historical reality. Point out how dangerous BDS is. Point out that in BLM, Black Lives Matter. I'm sorry, don't all lives matter? Yeah. yeah. But point out that in Black Lives Matter, part of the manifesto is to destroy Israel. That is in their manifesto. That is in their underlying theology of who they are. That there should be no Israel. Point out that this, you know, Palestinian state, there is no historical Palestine. They were not related to the Philistines. There is no historical Palestine. 
destroy the Jordanians who were thrown out of Jordan. Point out that uh, people like Islam and Omar, who they really are, what they really want. They want us dead. Philosophically and physically. Don't attack the Democratic Party. Don't defend Trump. Convert him back to Judaism. You know, it's interesting. Rabbis, as far as I know, the only orthodoxy ever practiced by rabbis isn't orthodox rabbis demanding that their congregants become observant. It's reform rabbis demanding that their congregants are politically liberal. <laughs> so you know what? Take on your rabbi. <clears throat> Quit being wits. And I mean this. If you don't like your temple and you think this rabbi is a jerk, which many of them are because they're using this as a political holy moment from their religious service. We're talking about it. I, I didn't have Marco Rubio come speak at our temple during service. Because it's not the place. If you see a rabbi do that, call him out. See, here's what's happening. There's a whole lot of Jews. 85% of Jews do not go to temple two days a year. I'm willing to bet that a lot of them are politically conservative. But they don't want to go to Chabad because they aren't theologically or, no, orthodox. They're theologically liberal but politically conservative. They go to a theologically liberal synagogue where they are preached about Saint Obama. <laughs> right? So when you see that, don't just walk away. Let the board know. Let the rabbi know. You are losing me as a participant. You are losing my money for dues or tickets or whatever else. And you are losing my accolades because of you preaching politics. You have never heard me, those of you know me, I don't preach politics from the temple. Yes, one one. I don't preach politics from the temple, right? Or from the ball, right? Take it on. You have here, and I have a couple of articles that are written from PJB and the new resources. You had a concept there, I'm going to keep it in front. You have here a study sheet. You have here the ammunition to take every secular Jew you know, and, if, and they're leftists, and take them out of leftism. And here's what I want to say to you. You also have an obligation to do that. Not because of politics, but for the Jewish people. For our children, and for our children's children. So thank you for being kind to me. Let me come here back. Because you need to take well, it's vital for you. For me, it's, it's not mine. For, you, for, for me, it's something you, you know, house train your dog with. But um, <laughs> except that's redundant. Um, so <laughs> what you do is, is you very simply take it out of the New York Times. And you got, you got to always remember, our dialogue is not because I want to convince you to come to be for public, and it's not because I want to convince you. It's not because I want to convince anyone. Our dialogue is. I want the Jewish people to survive, don't you? I only ask questions that you know the answers to, and that you can only get the answer. What Jew is going to say, nah, I don't want the Jewish people to survive? Right? <laughs> ask, so it's not, I'm not interested in the arts. I'm interested in being Jewish. I'm interested in our people surviving. I'm interested in Israel being there for my children and my grandchildren. I'm interested in not having a problem like some of the bills that have been put forward in California to make circumcision illegal. Because I will circumcise, I mean, I circumcise my sons, because Hashem, I will be alive to be there at the grid for my grandchildren. 
assume it was. Um, and, <laughs> right? So, so take it out of the key in this is to stop making it a political dialogue and instead make it a Jewish machlokha. How many of you know what the term machlokha means? In Talmud, the rabbis are constantly arguing with each other, and it's called a machlokha, a machlokha, a debate. Not for their own glory, but to understand life, Judaism, God better. Make that the dialogue. You want, you, you want to be able to circumcise your grandchildren, right? Who's going to say that? Yeah. Power, wise and fellow. Just a quick uh, question. You have this on PDF? Uh, I do not. I just have it on a Word document. I do have a Word I have an electronic copy of it. Yeah, so you pop, is it possible that you could uh, provide that so we could? It's possible. Okay. <laughs> If you could. Uh, I actually emailed it to Stephanie. Okay, what's that video? Well, so it came through, yes, I did. So maybe she can just summon it if you want. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. But yes, I did. So. And use it. This is all to be used, okay? The Hopi Indians have a great saying it doesn't mean anything, it doesn't grow corn to feed children. This is to grow corn, which is going to be the second, the goal is simple. But in the secular leftists, back to Judaism. Where they go politically from there, I'm not so concerned. Because they won't put up with some of this not okay stuff. Yes? So, um, the question is in regards to the reform movement in those temples, so many of the times they elicit the children in regards to under the terms of social justice. Mm -hmm. How do we actually, it's not justice, and it's not. <laughs> so, so let, let me let me ask the let me let me re, re, reframe that. Right. Um, and, and, and some of you have already said this. The problem with Judaism in the 20th and 21st century in America is rabbis. Okay. Um, too many rabbis have forgotten that they're supposed to be spiritual leaders, and intend and instead believe they are chief operating officers of corporation. The corporation happens to be synagogue, and they're getting paid a lot of money. Okay? Uh, and that's a problem. And too many people become rabbis because they want to be an actor or a politician or they become cantors because they want to be a singer and they're unemployed in any of those fields. <laughs> so there's a rabbi as an example I'm thinking of, not to say names obviously, um, who, who this guy was fired from one job after another, became a rabbi, and someone was making 400000 tax free a year. So he's got his own agenda. But he's a problem around that. It's one of the it's one of the problems that this is one of the reasons the dogs are so expensive. Because the top line, the above the bottom line is so expensive. And that prohibits Jews from coming and praying the dog. That's why we start we start our We're the first ones in the nation, non-Orthodox with no dues, no cost. They were good for the cars. And it's a pain in the butt and it's extremely hard. And thank God I did lots of weddings and things. Okay? But the point is, the first thing is to understand that. The second thing then is to understand that this phrase, tikkun olam, reparation of the world, is misused. Okay? We each have a piece of repairing the world. This is how tikkun olam is supposed to be. Every one of us has a piece of repairing the world only we can do. I can't do yours, we can't do it. It's like we each have an instrument to play in, in an orchestra. And you play a flute, you play a saxophone, you play violin, and I play guitar. I don't play guitar. So I play boot. <laughs> And we need to find our note and play it in tune, and we all find our right instrument, we play our one note in tune. This is the sound of heaven on earth. That's to go no law. Okay? Not, okay, let's just uh, make everything like a magic. The John Lennon song. So I think one of the things to say is look, this is not Jewish law. This is not Judaism. A friend asked me a number of years ago, he said, where do you think the reform movement's going to be in, in 200 years? And I looked at him and I said, Ronnie, I'm just silent on the whole map. Cop out. But we really think about it, it won't be. I understand that the whole movement world, I want to give this very direct, I, I, you can't count this on my time, because I'm going to ask <laughs> <laughs> You notice I didn't ask the question, I just told him. So, look, real quick, but there was just Judaism, we're observing Jordan's in, in the late 18th century, in the late 1700s, there's some guys in Germany, they say, you know what? We want to reform Judaism. We're going to celebrate Shabbat on Sundays. We're going to do our prayer services in Germany. We're cutting off our pants. We're not keeping kosher. 
We are reforming Judaism. Everybody who's not like us, we're going to call them Orthodox. Late 1800s, early 1900s, mostly in America and England. Some of the guys go, you know what? We don't want to be as conservative as those guys in the past, but we're more conservative than those machinists. <laughs> and that's the birth of the conservative movement. Okay? We're talking a 200, the movement's issue is a 250 year practice in a 3,700 year history. It's a blink and it won't be around in another 100 years. So you just keep going back to Jewish values. If you see one of the big ones, this is, I find this to be a really big one, is there's a law in the Talmud that says if you see a crime being committed across the river, you do nothing to prevent it, you don't do the crime. If I see someone preaching BDS and I do nothing to stop it, I'm guilty. That's what we're doing. Up, see, see, up, see. You can't, you weren't following the boat. I just want to make a small comment. The country Palestine was created in Soviet Union. I remember in the 1960s when Yasser Arafat every other month came to Kremlin. So this is the creation of Soviet Union. Second, well, it's English Empire even before that, but it is 100 years old. And, and I want to ask you a question. I have a friend who is very liberal, Jewish. And yeah. he said, you have a mark, she's not a mark, she goes and... I'm sorry, who is not a mark? She endorses Sanders. You have a mark. She is not a mark. She endorses Sanders. Sanders is a Jew. This is a I think I, I think they used to call them cobbles or collaborators, but um, but the reality is she did not. She, she, you can say that all day, but there are there's some instances here, but there are hundreds of instances of her being very clear how she wants Israel destroyed and, and should have been used. So that's I think the simple answer. Track that. There's enough stuff that you can track that. And those the comments by Philly even on Marvel. There's nothing. There's enough information. Let's see them. Hi, I'll fix you. My name is Bill Kutke. I have, <clears throat> I'm running into a social predicament sometimes, and I'm afraid it's going to get worse, but I can be with a group of friends, family, Jews, Gentiles, and I want them to be my friends, continue to be my friends, but some of them are so ramped up, they get so ramped up about, about Trump, I don't know if I want to be a jerk and start trying to take them on, or if I want to just leave, it's like a fight or flight syndrome. And uh, I end up just kind of not saying anything, stewing about it. And okay, that's not healthy. No. <laughs> uh, that's number one. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to make your therapy bills go way up. So that's number one. Uh, of course, so number two, I don't think that you should stew. But I think there's a way of making it effective. And again, I'm going to go back to the way that I find it. Rent is easier on Ralph. So if you want to shock when I start talking God talk, it's a doable. But uh, they're going to get to a place of their, their hatred for Trump. And at some point, they're going to say whatever they're saying. And they're going to be in love with Sanders. They're going to be in love with, um, someone said, Bocahontas. <laughs> Actually, we're going to do one, Maya Wapa. <laughs> One of the few whites allowed in the world allowed to lead ceremony by the American Indian Movement. I have seven godsons on the Yaki Indian Reservation. Yeah. I was I was Grandpa Wall's spot. I was bodyguard 30 years ago, and and uh, you know I, I still go to the reservation a half dozen times. Well, I used to half dozen, so you know the boys would just go for a week every year, but for the ceremonies. So when I make that comment, it's because I find it offensive. <laughs> well, the science of politics, I'm sure. So when they start talking about you know, okay. Then bring up the question of, yeah, but you know what, how do they feel about the Jews? Don't, don't go pro Trump. As soon as you bring up Trump, you lose. So they're going to talk about Big Bad Orange Man. Okay? And then someone's going to say, well, who are you for? And they're going to say, I am for Paul Harrison, for Budapest, for Harry Sanders. And then say to them, that's, that's the opening. Okay, but how do they feel about the Jews in Israel? Because across the board, every single one of them is messed up. God forbid any Democrats that are currently running become president just for our sake, for the sake of Israel issues. That's the place to get in. And when they say, well, wait a minute, I like them with everything else. So I have a very easy out. Okay? What I personally do is I will say to people, look, you know, 
I've become the guy I swear I'd never be. I've become a one issue guy. For the sake of my children and my, well, my grandchildren. I've become a one issue guy. How do they feel about Jews in Israel? It's something I really care about because that's what's going to affect me the most. Not the economy, not other things, but how do they feel about Jews in Israel? How does Warren Sanders pick the Democratic candidate, one after the other, is the problem. And then you switch it to theology. That's what I would recommend. I would never recommend just student now. If you want to get up and knock the table over and say, I'm leaving because you're all a bunch of jerks, I would feel that's better than just student. Because that's <laughs> everything. Okay. I have plans and I have two questions. My first question is, what's how did you become a one issue guy? Because I think that there was a transition for you. I'd love to hear your story. Oh, I became a one issue guy the, the, the moment my children were born. So it was with the birth of your children. That's that's right. That's that that's where for up for me, because I realized that for the foreseeable future they're identified as the children of Ralph. So quite honestly, I became one, which I always should have been. It just I needed that and, and by the way, I need birth of two of them at the same time to get it across. <laughs> right. Um, and so I work with the Jewish community engagement, and um, it's not that easy, and I'll explain why, and the you know, division between particularism and universalism. They do not want to see themselves as Jews first. It's tribal, right. it's insular. If I say to them, hey, if I'm a one issue kind of gal, which is exactly what I say when we have these conversations, they think of me as myopic, they think of me as uh, tribal, and it does not, so I'm for me, it does not further the conversation, but it, it, at least it's more. I'm going to give you two, two, sets tools, okay? two sets of tools, okay? Two sets of tools, that's a good one. Number one, talking about anti-Semitism, because I will guarantee that none of them realize the depths of the, of the history of anti-Semitism, because they grew up between 1945 and 1945, okay, number one. So they see that, that they grew up in a very specific time. Number two, I would recommend very highly to you personally that book, John Lennon and the Jews. John Lennon and the Jews. And it's, has anyone read this besides me? Okay. It is a fabulous book because, you know, we think of Imagine being this great, this great song, this great, you know, Imagine this, not that, right? Um, and the reality is it's a definition of hell. There's a beautiful story in it that I would recommend to you. It's a Persian Jewish story as well. And the Persian Jewish story is that uh, there is a, a, one of the Shahs centuries ago, and he's going to say all the Jews have to be removed from our kingdom at a certain time on this particular day. And the rabbi says, I don't know what I'm going to do. And his wife, as a good reverence and says, says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And she says, do what I tell you. And so the day comes a month later. It's the day before he's supposed to leave. And she gives him two rugs to the rabbi, and she tells him what to do, and he goes to the sultan to the shop. And he says, you know, sultan, I, I like to speak to the sultan, says, you're not going to change my mind, but what do you want to say? And he says, well, I have two gifts for you. He rolls out these two beautiful Persian rugs. And one is a gorgeous dark burgundy, solid color, and one is this amazing pattern. The sultan says, very beautiful. And the man, the man says, the rabbi says, that's great, one of them is for you, you get to pick which one. The sultan says, I should kill you right now for the arrogance. Why would I pick the boring red one when there's all the beauty here? The rabbi says, exactly my point. Why do you want to make your country, why would your country just <coughs> the color as opposed to the beautiful tapestry? I recommend the book highly to make you some tools, sure. as well as really knowing the answers. Yes, are the questions are all done. Uh, I can go all day. <laughs> Can you please share with our members a little bit about Temple Mayor Simcha? Sure. Um, I was a professor at Little American University and a rabbi in Beverly Hills, and we were all affected by our, uh, the stories we grew up with, right? And I grew up with the following story. My father got arrested, so was a flying tiger, and he came back from World War II in uniform to a shul in Chicago. They would not let him in on Kul because he did not have a ticket. We all know stories like that. And so he did not go to temple again until my older brother got rest his school as far as Because he said, God who saved my butt over there is in this place. And so he had a deep faith. He was not particularly practicing the observant, the observant when they grew up. And I always said the prophet before Brett, which is very funny, he would say, Now I know he's covering his head 
At the time, I just thought you had to say that to do that. <laughs> so, no, I really, I really did. <laughs> I thought, this is what they do. Uh, so so we, 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 uh, that, I've always had this problem with the pay to pray. Uh, how many remember Rabbi Shalom Schwartz of Lesson Memory Schwartz? Schwartz was a dear friend and a teacher from the time I was a teenager. Um, as he used to say, the High Center was a very non-profit organization. And, um, and because of his influence and my beliefs and, and being inspired and encouraged by his courage, uh, a few years ago, the idea was, when we came out here and the ultimate goal, and, and the goal was that we should have this community with no dues, no mandatory dues, no Jews should be forced to pay to pray, no Jews should be forced not to come to services, no Jews should have to make a decision between a mortgage payment and sending their kids to the Kimber Barnes. And when we did it through a lot of articles, um, that how this was never going to work. Never mind. <laughs> the bottom line is, thank God it is. It's hard. I mean, we don't even have a rush for the whole year at this point. We will. Somehow it all works out. And, and, and one of the things that's realized, I think, we've got to have skin in the game, we've got to have faith. And uh, we have an amazing team, those of you who know us, our weekly team teams. I have a control soul named Benny Lipson, who's a major jazz musician. We have a musical director, Matt Berman, who's played for a bunch of little people like Donna Summer, Justin Bieber, and the Tonight Show Man, and things like that. Um, High Holidays, we have Sam Glazer as our cantor. He is uh, considered by Moment Magazine one of the 10 most important Jewish musicians in the country. We've joined this year a percussion by M.B. Gordy, and we just won a Grammy this year, as well as he just had a gig like a week and a half ago. It's a little bit, uh, yeah, the who at the Hollywood Bowl, he was the percussionist. Um, so, so that's kind of what we, what we do. And it's people give their hearts, and it's hard, and it's the way it should be. But isn't that, no, no Jew should be turned away from it, ever. And, you know, those who can should get it. Those who can't should give it up. Other questions, or are you throwing me out? <laughs> I haven't thrown out of first places in this. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to do it. Well, we're we'll Okay, so we will now be holding um, an auction of, of uh, Bruce. He's <laughs> a temple fundraiser. He'll do, he'll do your windows. <laughs> so thank you guys for being good. Okay, we all make the choice. Make the choice to go and confirm the chapter. Think of it that way, not as making the Republican. Well, let's get every Jew back in the pew, back in the pulpit, back in the place of theology. Politics will can almost guarantee politics. Thank you.
So let's say you're a member of another synagogue, which first of all is a huge mistake, you should come over and hang out. We have more fun, don't we, Lou? Oh, yeah. Plus, um, you know, how many rabbis really know about the kill of the rabbis? So, if you're a member of the synagogue and your Jews are less than 10% of your gross, how many of you fall into that category? Okay? Give the remainder of the 10% to JRA. <laughs> Rabbi, you're welcome here at any time. But until we meet again, thank you all for being here. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Thank you.